Good morning, church. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you gathered here today as we come together to worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. My name is Amanda, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Millington First United Methodist Church. And on behalf of our church, I'd like to share with you some announcements about what's going on in the life of our congregation. You can find these announcements and more printed in your bulletin, projected on our screen, and included on our announcement screens in the hallway to my left and your right. You'll also find restrooms in that hallway on my left and your right, as well as restrooms in the back of the sanctuary if you should need those during the worship hour. If you're visiting with us today, we'd be so very grateful if you would use our tear-off sheet from the bulletin to let us know that you were here, to leave your name and a place where we could follow up with you, to thank you for your presence, and to see what questions you might have about our faith community. If you'd like to offer a prayer request, too, to be shared with our prayer team via email this week and to be printed in next week's bulletin, you can use this same tear-off sheet as a visitor or regular attender uh, to let us know what prayer concerns or joys you would like lifted up on your behalf to the Lord. Again, here are a few announcements about what's happening in the life of our church. I want to call your attention to a few important meetings that we have coming up. Our staff parish committee will meet, uh, relations committee will meet next Tuesday, September 20th at 530 in Williams Hall. And we also have an administrative council meeting scheduled the following Tuesday, the 27th at 630 in Williams Hall as well. Uh, if you're part of the SPRC committee, please make sure that that is on your calendar. If you're one of our uh, regular officers in administrative council, we know that you'll be there to report on what's happening in your ministry as well. Our administrative council meeting is also open to all members and friends who'd like to know more about what's happening uh, in the life and ministry of our church. So you're invited to come and to join us for that meeting on the 27th. You'll note that in our uh, bulletin, you'll see an update to our Good Neighbor Day opportunities. Uh, several of us enjoyed goat days yesterday, even in the rain, uh, and had a great time meeting uh, new and old neighbors. It was good to be together, to be out in the community, um, and to meet folks uh, together in the love of Christ. Uh, on your updated sheet, the opportunities this week are in bold, and I want to call special attention to one. On Tuesday, our church is providing the dinner for uh, the University of Memphis Wesley uh, Campus Ministry, the Wesley Foundation, uh, for their students. Uh, right now, that uh, Wesley Foundation actually serves not only the University of Memphis, but also Christian Brothers University, Rhodes College, and Lemoyne Owen College. There are connections all over the city that students make with the faith community uh, that offers love and grace in the Wesleyan tradition. We're excited for the opportunity uh, to meet those student neighbors and our connection and to provide dinner. Uh, I spoke with Morgan, who's the executive director of the Wesley Foundation last week, and he said right now they're averaging around 50 students every Tuesday. So I know that you'll want to come and meet some of the students uh, who are supported and loved because of the United Methodist Connection that we share. And that's a ministry that some of our connectional dollars go to fund. And so it's something that we should invest in, not only with our money, but with our time and prayer and presence. If you have the opportunity, you can come and join us at 3 o'clock this Tuesday in the Williams Hall Kitchen as we cook that meal and prepare it. We'll have a carpool that's leaving at church at 5 o'clock to head over to the University of Memphis Wesley Foundation location. If you can't join us in the 5 o'clock carpool, you're welcome to meet us around uh, 6 to 6.15 as we set up for dinner. And at 6.30, we'll share in a meal with the students. And our carpool, though everyone's invited to stay as long as they'd like, our carpool is going to stay for the program on community care at 7 p.m. If you have any questions about that, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to tell you more or to let you know how you can join in that opportunity. Again, you'll find other opportunities to be a good neighbor this week printed in bold on that sheet and opportunities throughout the rest of the month. Friends, with those uh, announcements shared, many more printed in your bulletin for you to read and see what's going on in the life of our church. We come now to quiet our hearts and minds in God's presence among us. Thank <laughs> you. 
for us. He embraces us with his transforming and forgiving love. Dear friends of faith, let us rejoice in God's love. We are called to receive that love and reach out in compassion to others. Good morning and thank you Elizabeth for that beautiful pre-service music and our prelude this morning. Our hymn of praise this morning is I Stand Amazed in the Presence, page 371 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing all five verses. <laughs> Thank you. 
as we prepare ourselves to sit at God's table of love and grace this day, we come first to acknowledge our unworthiness, the sins that keep us far from God, far from one another, and far from the spirit of God that lives within us. As we confess these sins, we know that we find a Savior who stands ready to forgive us, to love us, and to lead us into new life. Will you join me in our invitation to the table, which you can follow along on the screen or on the insert included in your bulletin? Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our friend, invites us to his table of grace. He has saved a seat for you and me. In fact, there is a seat ready for any who wish to come and feast at this table, for all who seek repentance to come and find love. We come to the table of God recognizing our need for divine grace. In humility and honesty, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Jesus, you call us to follow your way and carry the cross. We confess, Lord, that we often fail to follow you. Carrying this rugged cross is so hard when we are satisfied with comfortable lives. Carrying this cross requires that we speak up when it would be easier to remain silent, that we stand up when it would be safer to sit down, that we reach out to others on the days when we would prefer to keep to ourselves. God of love and grace, flow through our messy lives with your abundant grace. When we close our hearts and doors, open us to share your grace with our neighbors. When we neglect the needs of the world you love, forgive us so abundantly that we might be moved to give as abundantly as we have received. When we let pride and self-interest rule our days, Forgive us so miraculously that we might live with humility and selflessness. Through your abundant love and miraculous grace, may our world come to know your ways as we take up our cross in service to the world. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's steadfast love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God as ushers come forward for our offering.
as our children come forward for faith of the child. and dip when you go to the Mexican restaurant? Awesome. You know, sometimes food is a way that we share love with others. I really like to make food to share with other people. Sometimes just as something to make them happy, like I make them some cookies, or sometimes if they're very sad or something hard has happened in their life, I'll make them dinner and take it over to their house. Food is a way we share love. Your mom and your DG and all those other people who help feed you throughout the day, they offer food to you because they love you. Jesus knew that food is really closely connected to our hearts and loves. And so he loved to sit down at the dinner table with friends and neighbors and to share stories as they ate a meal together. Did you notice that we had a special table set up today? You saw when you walked in? I know, it's a little bit different than we're used to, but we're setting a table because today we are going to have communion together. And when we share that special meal that has bread and juice, we remember that that bread and juice are Jesus' love for us. Jesus loved us so much that he gave up his life so that we could be forgiven and loved by God forever. Jesus knew food tells us about love. So next time you have your favorite meal, I want you to think, who loved me so much that they made this for me, or they bought this for me? And when we share in communion later today, I want you to remember that bread and juice, they are symbols of God's love. God's love for you each and every day. So we are going to say a prayer together, thanking God for food and love and all the good stuff in our life. Will you bow your head and hold your hands together and pray by repeating after me? Dear God, thank you for food, especially our favorites that fill our bellies and warm our hearts. Help us remember, just like our favorite meal, the meal we share here at church, the bread and juice, Jesus' body and blood, they are symbols of love. Your love for us. We are so very grateful that you love us, God, and that you forgive us, and that you give us good things to eat. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. You can go with Miss Debbie to the Children's Church or back to your seat with your parents. <laughs>
You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, 
Don't take your place, your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. Instead, when you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place. When your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. Then Jesus said to the person who had invited him, When you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a baby, <coughs> invite the poor, crippled, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Instead, you will be repaid when the just are resurrected. When one of the dinner guests heard Jesus' remarks, he said to Jesus, Happy are those who will feast in God's kingdom. Jesus replied, A certain man hosted a large dinner and invited many people. When it was time for the dinner to begin, he sent his servant to tell the invited guests, Come, the dinner is now ready. One by one, they all began to make excuses. The first one told him, I bought a farm and must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five teams of oxen, and I'm going to check on them. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. When he returned, the servant reported these excuses to his master. The master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go quickly to the city's streets, the busy ones, and the side streets, and bring the poor, crippled, blind, and lame. The servant said, Master, your instructions have been followed, and there is still room. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways and the back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Will you pray with me and will you pray for me? God of grace, we give thanks that we have been invited to sit at your table. And we know, Lord, that by accepting that invitation, we have also accepted the invitation to become your servants, to go out into the highways and the byways and to search for the people whom you desire to come and take their place in a place of honor, one you have prepared for them. God, we pray, give us eyes to see our neighbors, not just the ones who can repay our favors of kindness and friendship, but our neighbors who are in need of your love and grace and salvation, who may never repay the invitation we offer them in the ways that we expect, but who might be invited into your glorious love through the actions of our hands and our lives. God, we come to celebrate your grace this day. And now, by that same grace, I pray that you would draw me beneath the shadow of the cross, that what is heard today are not my words, but yours. And what is felt in all of our hearts are not our own desires, but your will, O oh God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's a hard story that we turn to in the gospel lesson today because Jesus turns our social conventions on their head when it comes to throwing parties. When it comes to setting tables and inviting guests, Jesus throws a wrench into the way we usually go about that business in our lives. But perhaps we needed a hard story today because we have had a hard summer in our community, haven't we? In our city and area, there has been story after story after story of <coughs> violence and hardship and injustice and fighting and hatred and racism, so much that it feels at times I can barely breathe when I wake up in the morning. 
I don't have to recount the stories for you. I know you've seen them on the news. And perhaps you have weeped like I have these past few weeks of the kidnapping and murder of a bright, young mother who loved Jesus with her whole heart, mourning the death of Eliza Fletcher. Perhaps you were gripped in fear, too, as news about a citywide shooting broke out on Wednesday. Perhaps you were praying, too, like I was when I knew Carol Harrison was stuck at AutoZone Park. I just wanted her to get home safely. I just wanted everyone that night to get home safely. And we had to wait for hours to know if that would be the case. Perhaps you, too, wondered about all the times you've been shopping at Target in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. If you, too, might have been forced into another car, taken to the ATM, held at gunpoint to get money out, and prayed that you would make it back home safely to see your family. On top of all of these stories, we each have stories that touch our own lives, don't we? Stories of hardship and pain, stories of grief in our families and our friend groups. For me yesterday, as I walked from our church booth to go see our friends who were cooking delicious barbecue, I got a phone call from a good friend to tell me that a youth that I loved, that I knew was a child in Bolivar in the last few years had been caught up in gang violence and in drug dealing, and that he'd been arrested this past week and likely charged, will be charged with attempted murder. Someone I knew, who I taught Jesus' love to, was caught up in patterns of violence and hatred that are so much bigger than his own life. Yet it's his life that is affected in these moments and the lives of those that he's hurt as well. Friends, we come to a hard story because we lead hard lives. Our world is hurting all around us, and we are not immune from that hurt, that grief, that pain, that violence. Perhaps I've been more sensitive this summer. I know growing up in Memphis, it's always had its dangers, its violence. But perhaps I've been more sensitive myself because of my good friend whose life was taken by gun violence in July. I often thought about what Atura might have said these past few weeks as it seems like we can't catch our breath in between all of the news stories that break our hearts. Knowing her heart, knowing that it had been my plan to invite her to come during this series, this neighbor series, and share with you her heart for what it means to be a good neighbor, work that she cared so deeply about that she wrote her Doctor of Ministry dissertation on what it means to be in right relationship with God and with neighbor, knowing that heart of love that she carried. I imagine she might invite us to change the narrative of how we read and react to these news stories that bombard us day in and day out. Last week, we invited ourselves to change the narrative of how we talk about our own lives, on our altar still are the gifts of head, hand, and heart that we offered to God to be used in ministry. And then we challenged ourselves to go out into the world to find one new neighbor or a neighbor that we love well and learn one new story about that person's life so that the narrative of their life might be changed in our eyes. I think Atura might invite us to change the narrative of why do these terrible things happen in our community to a question of why do we have a community where we allow terrible things to happen? Why do we have a community where people feel that they must steal in order to eat? Why do we have a community where young people are not loved and mentored and supported so that they go out and find uh, to spend their time committing terrible acts Acts of violence, they do not have the mental capacity to truly understand the consequences of. A Torah would ask us, friends, what are we going to do as neighbors in this community to stop the hurt and pain that we see? To not distance ourselves from it? Because that is not what Jesus did. Jesus came and met hurt and pain head on. 
He looked into the eyes of people grieving and suffering and offered love. <clears throat> so perhaps we might be invited, how will we respond? What will we do as individual disciples, as this congregation, as the body of Christ in Millington and the greater Memphis area, what will we do in response to the hatred and violence we've seen this summer? Jesus offers to his disciples today the chance to change the narrative of how they would choose to throw a party. He tells this story that captures my attention about a certain man, is what he calls him, who throws a party for all his friends. And we can read between the lines because in Jesus' day, if you were throwing a party for all your friends, that means you had some money. And we know that to be true because we hear that this certain man has servants. And what we expect is that when you lay out a feast, a party, people will come. Doesn't everyone love a party and free food and free drink? Doesn't everyone love to come and have a good time? But in this story, it seems that this certain man's friends, the people he expected to accept his invitation, they're too busy. They're too distracted. It reminds me of what we talked about a few weeks when we talked about how the calendar can control our lives. These are first century examples of a calendar controlling someone's life, so much so that they don't have time to accept the invitation to their friend's party, which is really, they don't have time to accept an invitation to be part of this life, to be part of this celebration, to grow in relationship with this neighbor. And so the man who's already set a feast before him decides, well, let's not let a good party go to waste. And so he sends his servants out into the highways and byways, the busy roads and the alleyways, and says, find anyone who will come, find those who are never invited to the party, and let them know that my house is open to them. Whenever Jesus tells a parable, we're invited to put ourselves into that parable. At times we might put ourselves into the category of a certain man throwing the party. Maybe you've thrown a party before where the people you invited didn't exactly come in the number you had hoped. And you found yourself disappointed and discouraged. Or perhaps we've found ourselves being those who received an invitation but didn't have time to accept it. Maybe sometimes you have been the person who needed that invitation, who felt forgotten and lonely, and because someone saw you, someone spoke love into your life, your life was changed. It was transformed through the love of another. Today I wonder, what if we see ourselves as the servant in the story? What if it's God who offers the invitation <clears throat> for those to come and to feast at his table. And what if we are the servants who carry that invitation? As I thought about that, if I had put myself in the place of the servant in the story, a few thoughts occurred to me this week. The first thought was, when I think about who I want to invite to God's table, who I want to invite to be part of our church community, I confess I most often think of those people whose lives look like mine do. The people who are busy with farms, or oxen, or getting married. The people who might be too busy to accept the invitation that I offer. And I confess I most often think about that because I think how easy it might be for someone who looks like me, who thinks like me, who lives a life similar to mine, how easy it would be for them to accept the invitation and for our table to not be disturbed. For us to go on and feel good that we had more people in the pews. But would we be changed by that invitation? What Jesus' story teaches me today is that, as the servant, I am called not to offer the invitation only to those who look like me or think like me or lead a life similar to mine. I'm called to offer the invitation to those whom I would pass on the street and not even give a second glance to. I am called to offer the invitation to people who lead a life so different than mine that at times I judge their life choices. 
I'm called to offer the invitation to those who are hurting even more greatly than I have been hurt this summer. Because it's those people, friends, whose lives will be transformed by that invitation. Now we know the people who are too busy to accept the invitation, their lives to be transformed too. So we don't stop offering it there either. The master of the house, he doesn't say, the next time I throw a party, I'm just going to skip all over those friends and go straight to these people who came this time. I like to think the next time the master of the house threw a party, his invitation list was just longer. He just had more friends to invite that time. I wonder, friends, are we inviting those who God is calling us to see what stands in our way of seeing who God has placed directly in our path to offer love and grace to you as a neighbor this week? Are we more concerned about crowded pews? Or do we hear Jesus' call to have crowded tables? To invite people to experience the love and grace of Jesus right where they are. Because we know it's not our table we invite them to. It's the Lord's table. And that's work we do, friends, together with every other church in our community. We are not in competition with our friends across the city who are offering God's love and grace. We each, as unique churches and congregations, have our own gifts to offer to the community. And when we work together in partnership, amazing things can happen. This summer, our school drive supply was doubled because we invited other congregations in our neighborhood to join us in gathering school supplies. In the 901 church, our neighbors just down the road took us up on that offer, and both our congregation and theirs collected about the same amount of materials. Who loses in that equation? No one. But who wins? The community the children, our teachers, our schools. Very soon, our food pantry will go back to operating two days a week because our neighbors at St. Williams have heard the cry of the hungry in our community, and they know that our food pantry is overloaded on Tuesdays. You can ask Sammy. I bet she can't remember a Tuesday where there was an empty appointment. In fact, what she'll tell you is about all the Tuesdays they took on more people than they really had time to to make sure that no one in our community would go hungry that day. And so our neighbors at St. Williams are coming to join our effort here. What a gift it is that we have the privilege to host the food pantry here in this community, but it doesn't belong to us, does it? It belongs to Jesus. And with our neighbors, we are going to make a difference and more people will be fed. Who loses in that equation? No one. Instead, God wins. The hungry people who need food are fed, and our discipleship is deepened. Perhaps it's time we change the narrative of what it means to look like, or what it means to live as a disciple of Jesus. That it looks like so much more than just coming to Sunday morning worship. Friends, I know you know that because I see you in the community. I see you impacting the lives of your neighbors with your love and friendship. And I wonder, what would it mean if we fully claim that just as much meaningful ministry happens in your life, Monday through Saturday, as happens when we gather together for worship? Worship is important. This is where we come to be filled up with God's love so that we can pour it out into the community over the lives of our neighbors every week. We're invited to see the difference God makes in our life so that we can point out to others where God's love is leading them in their hardship and grief and pain, in their loneliness, and in their wondering if life really means anything at all. Because we are transformed this morning, we can help transform our community this week. When I was at a meeting this past Thursday, during our devotion, one of the pastors gathered among us, Lenore, mentioned about an article she had read in a magazine once. 
She was sitting at the dentist's office waiting uh, and biding her time, and so she read in this magazine the results of a poll that they had put in several issues before. The question that this magazine had asked its readers was what word or phrase do you long to hear? I wonder, friends, what's your guess? What do you think the number one response was? A word or phrase you long to hear? I love you. Exactly right. Our world is hungry to hear the words, I love you. Any guesses on the second phrase? I thought it was thank you too, Missy. <laughs> it was I forgive you. Our world is hungry for forgiveness. And the third phrase, any guesses? Good job would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> now the third phrase people long to hear, friends, is that supper's ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's good news, isn't it? <laughs> but is that not the story we tell every time we remember God's love poured out on the table for us? Is that not the story that we hear, that God loves us? God forgives us, and God tells us the supper is ready. All we need to do is accept the invitation to come and feast. And because we accept that invitation, God tells us to offer it to others. This is an invitation that comes with work, but the best ones do. The best ones come with relationship and love and meaning for our lives. So friends, hear God's words today. I love you. I forgive you. Supper's ready. Hear those words, hold them in your heart, and carry them into a world that is hungry for that love and forgiveness and invitation to come and to sit at the table of grace. Linda, the spirit got into me, so we're going to skip the video. I had planned it'll come back another time. I promised y'all that. And what before. is the So we're, yeah, there we go. <laughs> what you'll hear as the uh, ushers invite you to come forward in a few moments for communion after we celebrate the great Thanksgiving together will be this song by the High Women, Crowded Table. I think that the High Women tapped into the Holy Spirit as they wrote this song and describe what it means to be someone who's been invited to the table of grace, and then who goes back out into the world to shepherd others towards God's love. So as we remember this precious story where we are loved, forgiven, and welcomed at God's table, may we remember, too, we are called to build our own crowded tables in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our churches. May we experience God's grace in these ways, today and always. You can join me on page 13, the INF of the symbol, as we remember this most precious story of faith that we share. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with the people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these God's mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, 